I've got that it's time for us to go ahead and get started. Good to see a good number out and a few more coming in as we uh, begin. Um, glad you're with us. We're going to continue looking at the family in just a few minutes. Uh, before we do that, just want to remind everyone that um, uh, of a few things. Number one, we have, of course, um, restarted our 5 p.m. service. Uh, our numbers were a little low last week. Maybe we, this week we'll get them up just a few more uh, as we go forward. But uh, if you keep that in mind. Also, our fall gospel meeting is, is approaching. Um, our brother Lenny Reagan from the Oak Forest Church of Christ in Goldsboro will be with us October the 9th through the 12th. So keep that in your minds as we move forward. Um, and then the men's meeting that was originally scheduled for yesterday will be this Saturday. We moved it one week. Uh, so keep that in mind, uh, fellas, as we move forward. Uh, any other activities or anything I need to remind people? Yes, ma'am. Um, Michelle is sick this morning. Remember Michelle Thompson. Anyone else? Any new? Uh, anything in addition to the bulletin? Yes, ma'am. I, I was wondering if we could move the potluck to the second Sunday of the month to correlate with the uh, really? gospel meeting, since we always have a potluck that Sunday. And yeah, I was going to bring that up and ask if that was something we could do. I hadn't done it yet. That's why I hadn't said anything. Everybody okay with that if we do that? Move the potluck to the second Sunday in Luke and same weekend as the gospel meeting. All right, so go ahead and plan on that. I'll, I'll let Doug know that and he can get that updated in the bulletin. That's quick. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? All right, let's begin with a word of prayer, please. Almighty God and Father above, thank you so much, Father, for loving and blessing us. Thank you, Father, so much for the blessings of each day that we are able to partake in. Uh, we're so thankful to be here this morning and uh, to be a part of the uh, Sanford family as we gather, as we assemble to worship. Uh, Father, we pray that you will uh, bless our time together. Uh, we pray that you will uh, be with our study this morning as we continue to consider the family and, and the way you structured it and your design for it. Father, we pray that you'll please continue to bless and uh, be with our congregation. We pray that you'll be with those that are on our prayer list and, and, uh, as well as those we've mentioned this morning. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless and be with each of these individuals and families, these situations that we are uh, thinking about. Father, we're so thankful for all the opportunities you give us to serve in our, um, in our church and, and in, um, in this community and in our world. Father, please continue to bless and be with us. All these things we ask in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we, uh, we began a couple weeks ago a series on the family, on building strong Christian homes. And we're going to uh, continue that this morning. We were in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 last week. And there we find the original design of the home. When God uh, formed Adam from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul. And what was one of the very first things God noticed about his existence? One of the only times in Genesis 1 and 2 that it says it was not good. It, what was not good? That he was alone, right? And so God um, formed Eve from the rib of Adam, and 
she became uh, a helper to him and to him, to her, um, because they were suited for one another. And so thus God established the family. And what was his command to them? Go forth and multiply. Go forth and multiply. Subdue the earth. Have dominion over it. And, and, and to multiply. And so thus God put in motion uh, the family. It's interesting to me that this is the very first godly designed institution. Now, of course, the church was in the mind of God, but it would be a long time before the church came around. This was God's first um, institution which he formed for the, um, for the communion of, of humans, uh, for the spiritual edification of humans. Uh, and so as we move forward, we'll talk more about the spiritual roles of the husband and wife. So, everything's good, right? Things going really well. And again, we noted last week uh, that we're not exactly sure how long Adam and Eve are in the garden. Um, you know, I, I think it's easy enough to say we're, we're within, you know, maybe tens of years maybe a lot less than that. But we're not in hundreds or thousands of years, but they're in the garden for some amount of time. They're communing uh, with God and with one another. And then we get to Genesis chapter 3. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, Genesis chapter 3. Now there was an original design of the family and the way God had intended for it to be. But chapter 3 changes things. Uh, sin enters the world, and it alters that structure of the family. And we'll know how that is as we move forward. But let's go to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start there. I, I want to look at this chapter and... And then we're going to make some application as we move forward. So go to Genesis chapter 3, and let's begin there at verse number 1. Now the text says, Now the serpent was more crafty than other beasts of the field that God had made. So he begins to illustrate this, Moses does, by Picturing in your mind a serpent. Now, he doesn't tell us exactly what's intended by that. Uh, is it a snake? Maybe. Is it some other kind of serpent? Maybe. Uh, we, I bet most of us, you put a picture of a snake in your head. It doesn't say snake, uh, but, but it's something akin to that. And he begins by noting what about it? Crafty. Crafty. Any other... Translations use other terms there. Subtle. Subtle. Cunning. Cunning. Maybe sly. All right, these different words, what do they all imply? If we were to, to uh, bundle all those terms into one idea, what, what might be your, the thought that comes to your mind? What is Moses, God, what is God trying to say about the serpent? He was taking the life. He's a liar. Not trustworthy. Intelligent, though. Isn't that kind of what that term implies? He's intelligent. Um, um, first, uh, first Peter 5 eight. how does Peter describe Satan? What's that? A roaring lion. And what's that lion? Lion. I can't have trouble saying that. That's my... My Appalachian accent, I have trouble with lying. To devour. He's what? Seeking to devour. Seeking to devour. You think about a lion crouching out in the, uh, the plains of Africa, maybe, and, and he's, in the, he, he's in that yellow-colored um, you know, brush where he blends in and he, he stalks um, you know, whatever prey he's seeking. He's sly, he's crafty. Here again, the serpent, what does the serpent do? He, he finds the underbrush, he lies in wait uh, for, for some kind of prey to come by that he can 
attack and, and subdue and devour. And so this very kind of aggressive yet intelligent imagery in our mind. And so um, there's almost with the uh, introduction of a serpent, there's almost this idea that, that Satan is doing what? Okay, he's relentless. He's lying in wait. He's watched. What do all predators do? Do they just attack out of no, you know? They watch. About they the stalk. Weakness. They watch for the weakness. They watch for the weakness, right? They're patient. They're patient. They're uh, stealthy. Um, they they create traps. You know, I think about one. Uh, there's a spider called a bird-eating spider where it gets down in these holes and it creates these nests and it tries to trap um, uh, big prey in it. It's called a bird-eating spider because sometimes it eats birds. Right? So it, it, it lies in wait with these traps. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 2. What does the Hebrew writer say? He says, therefore let us since we're surrounded by so great a host of witnesses, do what? Run with endurance or patience, the race that is set before us. And look to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. And he says to give or to lay by every weight which so easily ensnares us. So... Here is Satan. He's in the garden. He's in the form of a serpent. This imagery of, of this sly, intelligent creature stalking its prey. So Satan's been there. Now, another thing we don't know is how long he's been there. We don't know how many conversations he's had with the woman. We just don't know. Was this the first one? I guess it's possible. I don't think that's probably likely. I think they've had other conversations. How many times has he mentioned that tree in the middle? Well, again, we're not told. We don't have an idea. Was this the very first time? And she just fell for it the very first time? I don't know. Again, I think that's probably unlikely. But, again, that's opinion. I don't know. The Bible only tells us this one incident. And so there he is. The end of verse 1 said, He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You should not eat of any tree in the garden? Notice how he begins this conversation. What's this question intended to conjure or bring up in her mind? Doubt. Doubt. He's trying to spread doubt about what? Okay, that about what, what God had actually limited and not limited. And so it begins to get her mind to turning, turning, turning. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden. Is that true? Yeah, we may eat our trees, but not Okay, so so far, so good, right? But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst or the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So before I go on, a couple of questions that are not um, there explicitly. Where's Adam? Somewhere in the garden. Where's Adam? He's right there. The text later tells us that. He's there. And we'll find out why in just a minute. But remember that. He's there. Is she right in what she says? She right? She's right, isn't she? And then what God told them? What tree is he talking about? The one in the center. What? The one in the midst of what God was talking 
Okay. Well, what tree is that? The knowledge of good and evil. They could eat of the tree of life. They could not. We're not even supposed to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there they are. They're in the garden. And he, he brings this up. Verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You will surely not, or you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He did something pretty sly, didn't he? One word. He added one word. But the addition of that one word completely changed everything around it, didn't it? What was the one word he added? Not. Not. Simple three-letter word, but it changed everything, didn't it? It even seemed to change the way she looked at it. How do you know that? We'll go on in the text there. If I can keep from hitting the podium. Um, what does verse 6 tell us? Somebody read that, 6 and 7. Can we pause it there? So, how do we know it changed the way she began to think about it? She looked at it differently, though. Before, before any of that... Had, had the fruit itself changed in any way? No. Had the tree reformed into something different? Exactly what it was. I mean, the consequence was taken away from her head. Or at least doubt was, was there that wasn't before. She saw it differently, although it had never been different. I mean, nothing that it didn't transform into some other kind of tree. The fruit's still the same. What's Satan attacking here? What? The way her, she saw it in her own mind. Now, what I don't understand is, if you're all good, why would you even want to know what evil was? I never, that part of it, I never understood. The good and the evil. I'd want to know the good, I wouldn't even want to know the evil because they didn't have evil before. Because they don't know what it is, though. Well, they want to be evil. So she looks at it differently. You know, John says uh, that, you know, this is kind of the, um, the same characteristic of all sin is there are three ways we sin. There are three basic categories, three large, you know, overriding categories of sin. There's the sin of, of the lust of the flesh. There's the sin of the lust of the eye. And then there's the sin of the pride of life. And you notice here, she goes through each of those in her mind. She gives over to each of those. She begins to uh, look at it differently in, in, in now uh, a fruit that before she would not even touch because it was so undesirable. That now she's like, well, that actually looks pretty tasty. I bet it would be good to eat. I mean, I, I bet it would taste good. And then she does what? Well, that's a pretty attractive fruit too. I mean, what was something that she would not even be around was now something, well, you know what? I, I really need this in my life. And then... What was that third way he attacked her? You back up there. You shall, you will not surely die, for God knows what. This is really, there are two lies, he says. Now, Jesus says, I think it's John 8, 
here you remind me here, but it, uh, he was a liar from the beginning. It's 844, John 844, I believe, where Jesus says that he, Satan, was a liar from the beginning and the father, or was a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies or something like that. No, no. He's a father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's what it was. And, and so he describes um, Jesus does Satan in that way because of what he does here, I believe. He tells two lies. Number one, he adds the word not, which is a deception, a lie. It's just not right lie. It's not what God said. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what God said. And then he lied in the second characteristic, which is what? That you will be like God. What do you think it would be like to be, be like God? What do you think that experience would be like? If we, if we could, just for a minute, try to get into the mindset of Eve, what do you think that statement means to her, to be like God? Well, How is God true. different from us? Maybe to that's where we should start. Huh? To be all-knowing. Okay, to know everything. Now, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so there is knowledge involved here. How is God different than we are? Okay, he's perfect, perfect in his morality and his character. He knows when he makes a decision whether it's right. Yeah, he already knows. Yeah, he has all knowledge, right? This idea that he knows what's uh, what's happening now, what's happened in the past, and he even knows what's going to happen down in the future. Ten minutes, ten hours, ten years from now. There are a lot of ways God's different than us. I was hoping to bring up more conversation here, but... He yes, knows sir. the truth, so he can't, really, he can't be tempted. I mean, if you know the truth about something, and you see it for the ugliness that it is, you know, that sin and temptation is, you're not going to be tempted by it. I mean, God mm-hmm. sees the truth. You know, a lot of times it would be so much easier in life if we could take our blinders off and see the truth of what tempts us. It wouldn't be so Yeah. And, and on top of that, God isn't flesh. We are, right? And that's all. There's a whole big pile of stuff underneath that, but, right? And those are huge differences. So I think it's just it's so hard for us to understand this. Even last night when we did our Bible study, um, the boys. Um, after the Bible study, we're sitting there talking to me, and they were like, well, God knows how many hairs are on my head, and God knows if we are going to lose power. And God, you know, it just ended up being a conversation, and it's just, it's so hard to describe. And we have such a limited view inside the window of God, don't we? Such a limited uh, view. God is Every way you could ever think of, he's more than us, infinitely more. And there's so much more we could say about this, but you imagine in Eve's mind, all this is dancing in her head. I mean, you talk about the concept of being like God, that's such a big, vast thing. It's like a, 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 a chasm that's impossible to swim in. Like that's, that's an ocean too wide and too deep for us to to ever grasp. And she's sitting there and all of this is running through her mind. Now, where's the lie in Satan's statement? Did you catch it? Well, he says you'll be like God because you know good and evil, but he's twisting the truth. I mean, yeah, their eyes are going to be open when they eat of that tree. And he said you're going to be like God's, but she doesn't all that yeah, it's, it's a lie. You cannot be like God. There's never an opportunity for us to be like God in his full essence. And the difference in what she was being told and what she was thinking probably had something to do with the power behind it. And that God knows the difference between good and evil and has to 
power to control it where she might get that knowledge that she doesn't have the power to withstand evil in her life. Well, we prove that over and over again. Right. By the way, we live. We prove that and people are to be true. I mean, and, and so he attacks her pride of life. <coughs> and, and so the text goes on there. Um, says, uh, she took its fruit and ate. This is a monumental moment in human history. That's a short statement. Man, the impact of that. Don't over under, don't underestimate that. Everything changed. Everything was altered. Remember what I said before? Where's Adam? He's standing right there. How do we know that? Well, what did she do? She ate it. She turned and said, here, you eat. And he ate. Now we're going to go later on to 1 Timothy chapter 4, or 1 Timothy chapter 2, 15. Paul digs into this just a little bit. He'll recall this to mind. And we'll talk about that. But one of the things he lets us know, 1 Timothy 2, I believe it's verse 15, is that when Adam did it, he knew what he was doing. Now she had been tricked. Um, Paul says that she had been deceived. She fell for the lie. Adam just did it. He knew what he was doing was wrong. In some ways, what he did is even worse than what she did. So, question. If he was there, was he privy to the conversation between her and the servant, or was this a conversation that only she could hear? I would assume that, that he definitely heard every word. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 12 tells, uh, Paul says, it's a discussion of worship. And he says, I desire that men everywhere lift holy hands. Right? And so he, talk, he first talks about the responsibility of men to lead in worship. And then he goes on into a discussion of the role of women in worship. And he talks about that a woman is not to uh, have a, um, is not to teach or have or exercise authority over a man. And then the end of the chapter, he talks about why, and he gives us two reasons why. Somebody read, um, is it verse 15 there, I think? 14. 14. Read verse 14, please. 14 and 15. Okay, so Paul, in talking about this, what is he, he lays out two, two important facts. Adam wasn't deceived. He wasn't deceived, and implying what? He was. She was. For, for him to not be deceived, what's he implying by that? He heard the conversation. He heard it. He knew what, he knew what Satan was saying. He just didn't. He, <laughs> Because mm -hmm. I think it just implies he'd listen to the woman instead of thinking about what God had told him. He'd have to know what the discussion was. So to, to say he wasn't deceived, if he doesn't know anything about it, then how can you say he But would... he did know about it because God told him not to eat it. No, I'm talking about he had to know what Satan had said. Otherwise, why does Paul use that, that he was not deceived? That phrase, was not deceived, implies that, that he had heard the same information Yet he wasn't deceived by it, but he just willfully sinned. And so there's a difference here between deceptive sin, where we're deceived into sinning, and, and willful sin, where, uh, where we, we know what's wrong. I'm just going to do it anyway. There's a big difference between those two. The outcome eventually is sin. However, how we got there is very different. And I think God looks at those very differently. And, and so... They're there, and now they both have this great burden of sin upon them. Now, prior to this point, 
Well, let's go on and let's read the next thing and then I'll bring this up. So, verse 7. Somebody uh, read verse 7, please. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were <coughs> naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. All right, so... Um, so they're there. They're, now they have this new awakening. I always wonder what that was like. Their eyes get real big, you know, and they finally, you know, they have all this new knowledge. It's almost like you upload a program on a computer. You know, you download a file, um, you know, and, and now your computer, which did not previously have that information, has it, right? And there's this new load of information. Uh, and so now their eyes are opened, like they have an awareness that they did not have before. And what's the very first thing they notice? Naked. Naked. What does that... Why is that shameful to them at that time? Okay. Know? Hold on just a second before we go there. I'm going there. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. We're, we're going there. Give, give me just... Let me step that way. Okay. So... Um, What's the big term we use to describe the knowledge they have? It's all under one big heading. Anybody think about what that is? What's that word? Morality, right? Morality. Before this point, did they understand morality? No. They didn't need it. No, so God is, or not God, but they have been given the first law of God which is the law of morality. Now they know certain things that they didn't before, and they know the weight of those things. Were they naked before? That's a funny word to say. I don't know. I always, every time I hear it, naked, right? I think that's got to be Appalachian in nature and, and epitomology, right? You, you hear country folk, he's naked. Don't be naked. He's running around here naked, right? Y'all can laugh. <laughs> Loosen up. Um, so, were, were they unclothed prior to this moment? Yes. yes. Well, what's the problem then? They've been right. walking around like this for a certain amount of time. What's the problem? They didn't know what would come of it, what evil could be naked, I guess. But do they, I mean, is there any evil to become of it? Because it's still just the two of them. Well, so is it is it evil to walk around in public naked? It is. We know it is because of what happened. And it's interesting, they sew fig leaves together and what does God do later? Makes them clothes. <laughs> we as human beings don't do a very good job clothing ourselves. It works every day. All right. You just look on Facebook during the summertime when the sun comes out and people start going to the beach, right? And the clothes come off. Right? We don't do a good job at that. God then had to go and make better clothing for them to cover them up. But now they know being, being unclothed in public was wrong before. But they just didn't bear the weight of it. Your child who's an infant and they're running around the house with no clothes on, they don't care. is running around the house with no clothes on, is that wrong? If you as an adult do it, is that wrong? Depends on the yeah, <laughs> it's wrong, right? We don't run around in public like that. Yet, does your child bear any weight of that? No. No, why not? They're innocent. They have no knowledge of morality yet. That's something that they'll be taught as they grow up. And so prior to this, they just simply did not bear any guilt of that. It didn't change the morality of being unclothed. It changed their what? Perspective. Their guilt in, in regard to it, their responsibility in regard to it. And so now the door has been opened to all these new responsibilities they have that they did not have before. And these responsibilities, if left undone or, or done, depending on what the morality is, now bears weight to it. Now you're responsible for it. And so this changes everything. And we're going to see 
how it changes their relationship and their relationship with God. So just as we go on, let's go to verse 8. Somebody read verse 8, please. Verses 8 through 11. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree thereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't eat? All right, so God is there in the cool of the day, possibly implying that this was a regular practice of God. We know that because they, they were hiding. Right? So they in some way knew God was approaching and so they hid themselves. Now, why did they hide themselves? Now, think about this. Don't just answer, but think about why were they hiding? Because they knew what God had told them not to do if they did. Shame. Mm. Think about it. Think about what the text actually says. They hid themselves because they were naked. Because they were naked. Now, you notice what, what God says when he comes in and he's looking for them. Notice what the text says. He says, where are you? Verse 9. What is Adam's response? I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked. Because I was unclothed. Now even Adam, they sew fig leaves together. What does he realize about it? It's not covering enough. Even he knows we're not covered up. And now we're in the presence of God. We need to be covered up. Right? So there's an even, even greater emphasis to this idea of, uh, of morality in, in the presence of God. And so God then, notice God's question. Who told you that you were naked? Where did this knowledge come from? Now, does God not know what's happened? Oh, yeah. Yes. He knows. He wants to see if they'll be honest. Okay, maybe he's checking to see if they're honest. Maybe. Uh, I mean, it's that they're naked, but they're not, it's not really that. I mean, it's the guilt of what they've done. They disobeyed. I mean, yeah, sure, they know they're naked now, but that's, not their, that's really not why they're ashamed. All, all in while they're ashamed. Well, I'm just giving you what they say. You know, they say they they say it's because they're 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 unclothed, right? They say we're hiding ourselves. God, they know God knows where they are. Right? Do you think they don't know God knows where they are? But yet they're behind some bushes because they're unclothed. And so he says, um, "Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat?" Now again, God knows the answer to this, but again. What are they going to say to it? And so a lot of it's about their response. Now notice what, what he says in verse 12. The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Now, you notice what he does. Shift it. Escape it. Right. But we I do it. That plays into the deceit thing. I'm still stuck on that. <laughs> that, that right there. Well, because it's different. It's deceitful if somebody bakes me into something like like he did with Eve. But then if I get baked in and then I turn to him and say, hey, it's fine. That's not him being deceived by me. That's him giving in to my womanly charm. And then this right here acknowledges the woman did it. I don't know. I just think we're making a big assumption saying that Adam heard the whole conversation. I'm just throwing that out there. Not that it matters. I don't think it really matters at all. But he he ate know. fully knowing what God had had God had, God had said, and he knew that that was a violation of the law of God. He knew that he was not deceived, right? And so he he takes it, and, and but now now out there in front of God, he he does what we all do, which is we shift blame to someone else. It's not my fault. I didn't do this because I wanted to do it because this woman whom you, by the way, God put in here. So who's he ultimately blaming? He's ultimately blaming God. 
That's who he's blaming. Now, um, now this was all before they had any kind of kids, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in chapter 4, but okay. yeah, this is just Adam and Eve at this point. Um, so, so he blames her, he blames God, it's anybody but me. And then the woman, then God said to the woman, what, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so who's she blaming? The serpent. Yeah, not me. It's that nasty serpent that you let in this garden. He deceived me, and I fell into it. And, and, and so everybody's blaming someone else. And so you have this first incarnation of man choosing something other than God. And that's what this really comes down to. They chose something other than God. Sin never uh, creates it never builds. It never produces something good. Sin always destroys something. It always destroys something. And one of the things it always destroys is our relationship with God. And it creates this barrier between us and God. You know, here you have the man, he feels guilty for his sin. This is the first time he's ever felt this way. You realize that too, right? So this is the first time he's ever really felt guilty. And so he's dealing with those emotions all at the same time that everything is going on. And so he, uh, he of course, blames the woman and ultimately God. The woman then tries to push blame off onto the serpent. All right? When you feel guilty, what's your response? I've got to get rid of this emotion. There's something about us as human beings where that emotion of guilt is a powerful emotion. And it's something God gave to us to keep us doing the right thing. If it's used correctly, it will bring us back to God instead of driving us further away. And so they've got, they, they are for the very first time experiencing what it feels like to be, to be wrong. To be misaligned with God. And, and so they feel this guilt. They want to get rid of it. And so they're trying to drive it away. And so they begin blaming everybody else. And, but this, this sin that they've committed is something that is going to permanently alter man's relationship with his wife and her with him. And we're going to see that as we move forward. Before we do, I want to note something in James chapter 1. Uh, I've only got a minute left. Let's don't go there. We'll, we'll stop there. We've got just a little bit I want to share in this uh, particular section. Then next week, we'll move on into some uh, what, what the restructured family uh, d- dig deeper into that that idea and, and what does it mean for us living today any other comments thoughts comments all right we'll be dismissed we'll reassemble for worship in about 15 minutes thank you